My good buddy, a man who, uh, if you're in consciousness studies, needs no introduction, the one and only David Chalmers. Thanks, uh, Stuart, uh, and thanks, uh, Alex and Gino and everyone else for putting the uh, conference together. I'm going to be, uh, I guess, in a way, picking up on the uh, on uh, some of the themes of media and design, as well as issues in uh, the philosophy of uh, of mind and consciousness, looking at ways in which the mind can be said to extend into the world. Um, there's really two occasions for me to be thinking about this topic. One is, um, well, there's a paper I wrote 10 years ago on this topic called The Extended Mind, co-authored with my colleague Andy Clark. Um, he's just published a book on this topic called Supersizing the Mind, to which uh, I wrote the foreword, a chance to revisit um, some of these issues. Also, uh, more, uh, more personally, I guess uh, um, a year or two ago now, I got myself one of these uh, really important bits of uh, philosophical technology, uh, an iPhone. Um, this is in fact a, uh, this is a very old-fashioned iPhone now, it's an iPhone 2G, I uh, remember those. Um, I've got a, uh, yeah, iPhone, I'm getting the iPhone 3GS very soon, uh, a couple of weeks, as soon as it appears. But this, this iPhone has rapidly become a very important part of my cognitive processes. Um, it's, uh, it's taken over many functions that, um, that used to be performed within my, within my mind. You know, all of us used to, you, you, don't, you don't need to have to remember um, telephone numbers anymore, right, given your own cognitive resources inside your skull. We offload it all into the iPhone or your, your cell phone or, or, uh, or whatever. The iPhone serves as a repository of my, uh, my desires. Um, you know, I go and order food at the local restaurant. Hey, what, what do I like here? Um, well, the iPhone, I've got a list on my iPhone of the dishes I, I like to order. Uh, it's this and there's this and there's this. And the iPhone is in fact serving as a, as a, as a repository. Of, uh, of you know what it is that I want and what I like. I'll get to some other functions later on. The iPhone can make decisions, can so on. So basically, what's happening is a whole lot of stuff that used to be done within our minds and um, is being offloaded into the world. It's bits of technology in our environment. This is the core thesis of the extended mind that uh, the bits of the world, in effect, are functioning as bits of the mind. So the, the key thesis of the extended mind is that. When parts of the environment are coupled to a cognitive system in the right way, they become parts of the mind. So the iPhone is at least, you know, some of the time when coupled to me in the right way, literally a part of my mind, not just a tool that I'm using, but a part of my mind. And, um, well, Andy and I, back in the Extended Mind paper, which came out in 1998, argued for this via what we called a parity principle. If, as we uh, confront some task, a part of the world functions as a process which were it down in the head, we would have no hesitation in recognizing as part of the cognitive process. Then that part of the world is, so we claim, part of the cognitive process. So cognitive processes ain't all in the head. And you think of this as, you know, sort of part of this, broadly speaking, anti-Cartesian movement of trying to move um, you know, cognitive processes which are, uh, which are in the head, and uh, take, taking the old sort of, you know, disembodied idea of, it, of a, uh, the mind as this disembodied thing, and, uh, and moving it out into, to see it as something which is far more continuous with our bodies and the rest of the world. Now, I myself, as some of you may know, it's actually something of a Cartesian in uh, some other aspects of my uh, philosophical life. So I'm a conservative about the extended mind in some ways, in particular, I'm, an ex I'm a conservative when it comes to extended consciousness. None of this should be taken in the first instance as applying to extended consciousness, but to ex um, extensions of other parts of the, of the mind, like belief and memory. I'll come back to consciousness um, later on in the talk. But what I'm going to do here is to go over a couple of key theses of the extended mind, um, talk about some objections, in particular talk about some reasons for ambivalence that I have about the thesis and explore um, what I see as a, the biggest worry about the extended mind thesis, and towards the end I'll say something about extended consciousness. Um, the key example uh, that Andy and I used in arguing for the extended mind is a case involving uh, Inga and uh, an Otto, two, uh, two subjects. Inga is meant to be a pretty normal subject, Otto is a, uh, a subject uh, 
with Alzheimer's disease who are relies on external tools like a, like a notebook. So Inga and Otto, they both want to go to the Museum of Modern Art. Inga recalls that the museum, okay, I want to go to the museum, what is the museum? Oh, the museum is on 53rd Street. She sets out towards 53rd Street. This is pretty normal. Otto, the Alzheimer's patient who relies on notebook and external tools, as many Alzheimer's patients do, reads in his notebook that the museum is on 53rd Street and sets out. No doubt if we'd ever written the paper a few years later, it wouldn't have been a notebook, but uh, something more like um, an iPhone. Uh, so after, so what is the status here of their, of their beliefs and their, and their memory? Well, certainly after the act of recollection on Inga's part, after the act of reading on Otto's part, Inga and Otto both believe, currently and consciously, that the museum is on 53rd Street. But that's not all. Take the Inga case. Inga, most of us think Inga, even before she engaged in that act of recollection, she believed that the museum was on 53rd Street. She didn't believe it consciously or currently, but, no, but she believed it, as philosophers say, dispositionally. It was there in the back of her mind, ready to be, to be used whenever it, was, uh, whenever it was, uh, was relevant. Most things we believe, we believe dispositionally. You guys believe that Paris is the capital of France. You probably weren't thinking about it until I just said so, but you believed it all the same. You know, the act of recollection just triggers the belief. So, um, so Inga believes that disposition. The thesis of the extended mind, the, the, the relative radical thesis that we argued for here, was that even before his act of reading, um, Otto was relevantly analogous to Inga. And therefore, uh, Otto also believed dispositionally that the museum was on 53rd Street, even though we can suppose nothing about 53rd Street is stored inside his head. Nothing about the location of the museum is stored inside his head. It's all out there in the notebook. So he believes that, but he believes it in virtue of it being part of this extended cognitive system. And the support for this thesis is via this parity principle. Otto's and Inga's situations are relevantly analogous. Otto's notebook plays the role of Inga's biological memory. And the claim is there are no defeating this analogy, so what goes for Inga here by the parity principle should go for Otto. If the biological memory is good enough to qualify Inga as believing that, then likewise the same for Otto, even though the notebook is outside the skull. And indeed, the same explanatory structure for explaining actions that goes in terms of beliefs and desires also applies to Otto. Why did Inga walk to 53rd Street? Well, she wanted to go to the museum. She believed the museum is on 53rd Street. Why did Otto? want to go to the museum. Well, uh, why, did, why, so why did Otto walk to 53rd Street? Well, he wanted to go to the museum, and he believed the, uh, the museum was on 53rd Street. So that's the, uh, the argument from parity. Now, you might say, well, there are relevant disanalogies here. And one thing people try to do is to point out disanalogies between the cases. I mean, one thing some people just do is say, well, look, uh, Otto, one thing you might do is say, well, look, here's a relevant disanalogy. Otto's notebook is outside the skin, whereas uh, Inga's belief is inside the brain. So I think one of the rules of this game is that you know, if there's a difference between being outside the skin and being inside the skin when it comes to being part of the mind, that can't be a primitively relevant um, fact. You can't just say, well, it's outside the skin, therefore it's part of your mind as if that settles the matter. You know, if being outside or inside the skin is going to be relevant to whether it's part of the, you're part of the mind or not. It's going to be relevant in virtue of something. You know, maybe there's some processing role that can play a whole lot better if you're inside the skin than if you're outside the skin. Maybe there's some other property you'll have if you're outside the skin and you're inside the skin. If you don't do that, if you just say outside the skin, therefore not part of the mind, without giving any other further reason, you're basically committing, I don't know, um, you know internalist chauvinism. Right, uh, you know, it's like, you're basically saying, well, you know, I mean, maybe it's, it's like saying, for example, you know, you're female, therefore you're no good at this, therefore you're not suitable for this job. Now, it's true, there are some jobs for which men are better suited than women, and there are some jobs for which women, women are better suited than men, perhaps ones that require certain...